Hello, we're back for another Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. Kendra, what do we have on tap this time? We have lots of new kits on tap, starting with Trumpeter's 148th scale MI-4A HAL. Developed in response to American helicopters like the H-19 Chickasaw in Korea, the MI-4 became the backbone of Soviet Army aviation. More than 4,000 were built and they served as transports, gunships, ambulances, and submarine hunters. At 148th scale, this model is a big sucker measuring 13 inches long with a rotor diameter of 17 inches. The boom is molded with the body halves. Petite recessed rivets mark the airframe along with select raised panels, open louvers, and solid engine screens. The clamshell doors at the rear are separate, but it is unclear if they can be posed open. There's a ton of detail inside, including the raised cockpit with instrument panel and upper console. The cargo troop compartment below includes bench seats along the walls. There's plenty of detail inside the clamshell doors, too. Underneath is a ventral machine gun gondola. Up front sits a well-appointed Shvetsov radial engine with cylinder banks in halves, intake manifolds, exhausts, and more. The tail rotor is a single part, and each of the four main rotor blades has molded droop. In addition to the windshield, door, and cabin windows, clear plastic supplies lights. Decals give dials for the instrument panels, tail rotor warning stripes, and markings for four hounds. Soviet yellow 16, East German black 569, another Soviet MI-4, white 03, and a North Korean helicopter yellow 910. Despite its size, this doesn't look like too complicated of a build. And it should build up into a nice replica of an important helicopter. This kit is back for the first time since 2016. It is the 1350th scale AMT Klingon Bird of Prey. This popular ship first arrived in kit form in 1995. And it has always been one of the highlights of AMT's older Trek kits. This boxing reflects a redesign from the 2010 kit when parts were added to pose the ship landed. Molded in Klingon green plastic, the parts feature raised and recessed surface details. The upper body, with the bridge and the mounts of the wings, is separated from the underside by side inserts. Flash on the wingtip guns belies the kit's age, but it'll be easy to clean up. The original kit had optional radiator baffles to pose the wings in flight or attack positions. The parts introduced in the revised 2010 boxing provide baffles to angle the wings up, gear bays, landing feet, and metal gear legs. Clear plastic provides the warp drive housing and a torpedo emitter. A small decal sheet supplies baffle details, insignia, and Klingon writing, and large diagrams show their placement along with detailed color instructions with callouts for Tamiya paints. Round 2's now standard dome stand with posable head is included for light display. While I have not personally built one of these kits, Aaron built one of the original versions. He moved a couple of times and then, you know, it didn't survive coming back from Australia, I don't think. But he assures me that the original ones went together well, and this one should too. Round 2 has released a couple of Lindbergh kits under the AMT labeling. A 148th scale TBF-1 Avenger and a 148th scale SM-62 Snark. Both kits originated in the 1950s and 60s, so don't expect modern tooling. Instead, there are raised rivets and panel lines, movable parts and operating features, figures, and support equipment for the Snark. Both feature nice new decals. These kits are all about nostalgia, the fun of reliving modeling in its first decades. So, with that in mind, be prepared for flash, sink marks, and poor fits. However, if you're looking for a challenge, these kits could be a lot of fun. It's been another busy week at Casemate with three books to look at. From the Images of War series, there's the Italian Campaign 1943 to 1945. Now look. We know the cover says 1941 to 1945, but it's 1943 to 1945 on the spine and on the title page. Look, in publishing, mistakes happen. But that takes nothing away from the content of the 232-page soft cover that shows action from the invasion of Sicily to the Gustav Line, Anzio, and beyond, with plenty of modeling inspiration. From Hellion's Europe at War series comes War in Ukraine Volume 2, Russian Invasion 2022. In detailed text, photos, and illustrations, the 96-page softcover traces the early days of the war. 
If you like the F-16, then Bertie Simmons' book, F-16 Fighting Falcon, American All-Purpose Combat Machine, will be of interest. It traces the F-16 from development and deployment, variants to upgrades, and combat. In 2021, ICM produced a series of 148 scale kits of the Bronco Light Attack aircraft. Now the company takes that subject smaller with the release of this 172nd scale OV-10A. Part breakdown here is similar to its larger scale cousin with the fuselage and halves with a separate belly and the roof represented by the center of the upper wing, which also helps align the booms and central stabilizer. Surface detail throughout is fine engraved lines and rivets that should pop under washes. Inside the cockpit has good seats, controls and instrument panels that should all look good under the beautiful clear parts. Templates for masks are included in the instructions. A detailed diagram matches ordnance loadouts to the marking options. Weapons included are Lao 10A, 33, 68, and 69A rocket pods, Mark 81, Mark 82, and Mark 77 bombs, and a 150 gallon fuel tank. Decals provide stencils for the ordnance and aircraft, as well as markings of four Vietnam War Broncos an OV 10A from Marine Observation Squadron 2 at Marble Mountain in 1969 a Navy bird from VAL-4 Black Ponies at Binh Thuy in 1969, one from the Air Force's 20th Tactical Air Support Squadron at Da Nang in 1972, and another Black Ponies Bronco in overall gray at Binh Thuy in 1972. Given the quality of ICM's work these days, this kit should build up into a beautiful replica of an OV-10A. Finally, here's another Russian self-propelled weapon system in 172nd scale. Hobby Boss's Russian 9A52-2 Smirch M multiple rocket launcher. Slide molding abounds in the chassis and caps. The launcher frame sits on the rear body with solid tubes, separate ends, and the frames to hold them. Decals provide markings for six vehicles in a variety of camouflage patterns. Another great kit that would fit well with a collection of small-scale armor. Look for reviews of the Hound, the Bird of Prey, Bronco, and the Smirch at finescale.com where you can find lots of other cool scale modeling content, how-to stories, videos, and many show galleries. <laughs> many, many show galleries. Also, don't forget callandblockhobbystore.com, where you can find all sorts of tools and supplies, including the Tamiya Hobby Knife and a Zuron Sprue Coat. Fine Scale Modeler Weekly is brought to you by Hobby Zone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard-to-find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs and by Cult TV Man's Hobby Shop, the place to go for science fiction and fantasy kits, decals, details, and more. So how many of us have received gift sets or gone online or out to the hobby shop and bought a set of hobby knives for ourselves? It comes with three handles, has a variety of blades in it. I'm willing to bet that the majority of us have something like this at the workbench. I got thinking, you know what? How many of us know what all of these blades are used for? Now this isn't, this isn't state secrets, right? You can go out onto the web and you can find the information there. It's not something that we just concocted here at FSM, but I thought, let's go ahead and save everybody the trouble of heading out there and let's talk about some of the most common blades that we'll use during modeling. But first, we should start with the handles. In a set like this, we've got three different handles. The number one, the number three, and the number five. Before we get going here, I'm not going to try to explain the numbering system. I'm sure somebody out there understands this arcane jargon. I don't know why. I, I, it, it, it's the number one, the number three, and the number five. There's even a number six that looks like the number five, but it's got a, it's got a metal handle. We aren't gonna even get into that. Let's start with the number one handle. The number one handle is the smallest handle in diameter that you're going to use probably at your workbench. It's about the size of a pencil in, in diameter and width, maybe four and a half inches long. And it really is what we would call your light utility handle. It's very maneuverable. See how quickly you can, and it's probably going to be the handle that you use the most at your workbench. The next step up, the number three, as you can see, is a bit thicker 
than the number one. In this instance, it's not quite as long. And what it is, it's meatier. It gives you something more substantial to hang on to when you are working with it. You'll also surmise, if you will, that this handle chucks larger blades than the number one handle does. These, the blades that you'll use with the number three handle are more substantial. We'll get into that. Lastly, we have the number five handle that can chuck or accept the same size blades as the number three handle, but what really sets it apart is it's a little bit shorter and it has this pretty chunky red plastic handle. You can find others that have like a, a hard rubber handle, but really something for you to hang on to if you need to apply some serious pressure to whatever it is that you're cutting. The other thing that makes the number five handle stand out is that it will accept the shaft here of a razor saw so you can get in there and saw away on whatever it is that, well, needs sawn. Now that we understand a little bit more about the knife handles, that explains the tangs on the bottom of the knife blades. These narrower tangs fit into the number one handle, while the wider tangs fit into the number three and the number five handles. Let's go through the blades themselves, lickety split. Here we have a number 10 hobby blade. It is what you would call your general purpose blade. It's got a sharp tip, it has a straight cutting side, and then this rounded edge down here at the end. You can trim with it, you can do carving with it, you can slice with it. It's just a good all around general blade. The other blades that we're gonna start looking at, they're more specific, but this one can do just about anything that you can throw at it. Here we have our number two and number 11 fine tipped hobby knife blades. You will find probably that these two blades will be your go-to sorts of blades while modeling. And in particular, the number 11 hobby blade. This is the most common hobby blade used in modeling. It chucks into the number one, uh, which means that you can get down in with that tip and you've got a lot of flexibility, a lot of agility to do cutting, um, slicing, not heavy duty carving or anything like that, but for light, delicate work, this is where you are going to be most of the time. The number two blade can do a lot of the things that the number 11 blade does. It's just that it is chunkier, it's bigger, and since it chucks into the number three handle, you've got a more substantial handle on there to be able to deal with um, heavier cutting that you may be confronting. Here's a number 26 blade, uh, also called a carving blade or a whittling blade. It is a heavy duty sucker. It chucks into either a number three or a number five handle and as the name suggests, you are going to use this to really carve on either wood, foam core, dense foam, something you know that requires more force and a longer cutting surface than is supplied by other hobby knives. This is a number 24 hobby blade, and it's also called a deburring blade, and it is specifically designed with this short, angled cutting edge to take, well, rough edges or burrs that are attached to your material, either by slicing thinly or by dragging it along and just scraping off the material. Here we have a number 16 hobby blade, also called a scoring blade. These are perfect if you want to rescribe panel lines. You can also use them for, for cleanup and a lot of the same sort of tasks that you're gonna use a number 11 blade for. Obviously, you don't have the same uh, length of cutting surface. 
Uh, but they are extremely agile. Uh, that's your cutting angle is going to be almost 90 degrees. Um, so you've got a lot of maneuverability with it. One of our contributors at FSM, Mark Jones, he uses these blades almost exclusively when he builds. And finally, we have chisel blades. Here are the 17, the 19, and the 21. The 17 and the 21 are flat chisel blades. The 19 is an angled chisel blade. And what you, as you might expect, you use chisels to take off thin slices of material, whether it's wood or it's plastic. You can also use it to carve designs, like if you're doing a diorama or you need to carve into foam or foam core or wood, these are going to be the tools that you go to. As we all know, a hobby knife is a must. It is an essential at your workbench. But even though we've gone through this sort of overview of what the blades were designed to do, that doesn't mean that we can't figure out new and interesting ways to put them to use at our workbench. And in fact, I'm really interested to know what knife blades you use the most at your workbench, and if there are any new and interesting ways that you've employed them while modeling. You can let me know at editor at finescale.com or in the comments below. Dude, you're okay. Um, yeah, but shouldn't I? Shouldn't I be? Just, I don't know. Just, just checking. I mean, I'm fine. A little, a little rough looking. No. Okay. Rough looking. <laughs> God, I can't catch a break around here. <laughs> so, uh, on to further information. Um, I understand you were just up in the Twin Cities area. Uh, Bloomington, Minnesota. Yes, for NNL North. That's one of the big car shows, right? It is a car, uh, scale auto show. It is. Um, it's a great show. The, the group up there who puts it on is a lot of fun, very welcoming, and the models are outstanding. So you shot some photos, but you also shot some video. Of I did shoot some video. So should we see it? Let's roll the footage. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Hi there, my name is Chris, and looking at this here, I'm a huge Wood Brothers collection. It started about 1990 when I found my first kit at a swap meet. It was a 70 Cyclone MPC, and it was $3.75. So uh, that started my interest in building a collection of NASCAR. Um, 1990 AMT had a model out, so I started with that. Um, I'm a Ford guy, been that way my whole life, and the Wood Brothers run Fords. Um, forever since day one, Ford Mercury's. So um, that's uh, how I started getting into that. So these are all plastic models that I built. I collect little die casts and I've got some NASCAR actual sheet metal pieces from the car. <laughs>
those were some really good looking models. Cars, yeah. trucks, the whole shebang. Got the got a look at the at the show itself. They gave us a greeting. They did. And got a couple of other special things in there. So that was kind of cool. I was real happy about it. We need to remind everybody to go and look at the NNL North Show Gallery, and you can see the link in the description. Link in the description below. And in fact, while you're at finescale.com, go ahead and check out all of the other show galleries too, because if you're looking for inspiration or just want to see what some some other modelers are doing, it's perfect. It's a to, great place to go. Yeah, lots exactly. Lots and lots of shows. Super entertaining. Yep. So until next time. We'll see you then. <laughs> Bye. This kit is back for the first time. It wasn't ready. <laughs> Sorry. It wasn't ready. I was adjusting my glasses. Petit. Petit rivet. Huh. I've got molded droop. Don't mess this up. <laughs> Everything's on the line. Development and deployment, variants to upgrades, and combat. Do you want that pen in your pocket? Yeah, do I look too nerdy? <laughs> But you had it in the open, so if you want to have continuity. Russian propelled. <laughs> so much better if it's a Russian propelled rocket launcher. <laughs> you could always say it like Aaron does. Chassis. Chassis. It's a chassis because very you Americans fancy, pronounce fancy. it as chassis. Art. I didn't swear that time. That was good. See, I'm getting better, maybe. It was fuzzy floating. And make sure we get all the band-aids in there. And like, oh, okay. <laughs> There's how we do it. Get all the band-aids in there.